This video is called The Components of Civilization. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the following things. First, we're going to be looking at what is necessary for a civilization to begin. The second is what keeps civilizations going. And finally, what causes civilizations to collapse. So as we talk about a civilization, it's important to understand what a civilization is, and the best way of doing that is to understand the seven components behind what causes civilizations to rise. The first is a stable food supply, and more importantly, food surplus. In order to do this, you must have fertile land. This is land that is capable of growing crops. Without fertile land, you will not be able to grow enough food to sustain your civilization. And food is the quintessential key, ultimate component that drives human history. And as we've been learning, fertile land is not available everywhere. So those who have it have a major advantage, and oftentimes this fertile land gets fought over. And this fertile land is so important because you must be able to develop more food than you have people farming. So you want ideally to have a small few farmers be able to grow enough food for everyone else. This allows for what's called a specialization of labor. That means where people can be paid and fed to perform non-farming ta farming tasks. If you do anything other than farm or hunt and gather, you need to go thank a farmer. Because specialization of labor, this is where people get paid to be artists, to be writers, to be stonemasons, to build buildings, to make shoes, to make clothing, to cook the food, to be athletes, to be warriors, to make the great works of art that we appreciate as civilization and as a society, to be government leaders, to be teachers, to be able to be here as students, all results from having more food than you have people to grow it. So that's the first and most important component. The second is religion. Religion helps to unify diverse groups of people because when Groups first form, they are family and tribal based. There's very strong unity there, and families typically focus on what keeps the family safe and survives. What religion does is when you start to have lots of families and lots of different tribes that are getting unified as one group, the religion serves as a common thread to help unify all of them together. It also helps to create power structures and social order. Typically, you see in civilizations a tie between the religious leader and the political leader. Many times it's even the same person. The political leader must be able to justify to everyone why they should follow him. And typically, sorry ladies, it is a him. And they tie the religious supernatural into their right to rule. And many times we see the leader claim to be a god or one of the gods to justify why they should be followed. This also leads into creating social order. Because if the gods say it, you have to do it. So this social order idea helps to give everyone a place in society and determine what rules and boundaries guide them. This flows nicely into central government. The central government is the centralized power. It's putting all rule and authority in the hands of a few select people. This allows them to provide law and order, to create the rules that help govern these diverse groups of people to keep them from killing each other, to keep there from being utter chaos, and to help them to work together to do something good. This also helps to keep internal and external peace. If people are becoming unruly, the central government can help correct them. 
if there's a neighbor that's starting to get hostile or wanting to take over your fertile land. The government's job is to help provide that protection or to negotiate out that peace. A huge component of how they do this is taxes. First, this took the form of food, and then as economics became more complicated, the form of currency. Because once again, everybody's got to eat. If you don't eat, you don't live. So taxes were brought in to pay for the food or to be the food for the government leaders. As these government leaders got more powerful and got tied in with religion, it was to pay to have nice facilities for their gods on earth to be able to rule. This money also gets used for civil projects to turn around and benefit other people. This school was paid for with taxpayer dollars, as is your education, as are the books you read, the technology you use here, the roads that you use to get to and from school, the buses that you used, and so on and so forth. So things that are not profitable in terms of making money but are necessary for societies oftentimes come from the centralized government and taxes that were paid to them. The next aspect is social structure. We kind of already touched on this, but let's look a little bit further. A social structure defines the place and purpose for all the people in society. For example, government leaders have more power and authority than priests who serve a different role than the merchants, the farmers, and in most every society until the Industrial Revolution, there was some form of slavery, all of which we will address later. But all advanced civilizations have some way of creating a social structure or hierarchy of who has more freedoms and privileges than others. You have writing. Writing is extremely important. Writing is not natural to humanity. Talking, yes. Drawing, yes. Writing, no. Writing is where you put symbols together to create meaning. They do not have writing everywhere in the world. Actually, very few comparable societies have complex forms of writing. This is important for documentation and sharing of knowledge. You cannot have a complex economy without having writing. You cannot have history and literature and to have shared legal codes without having some symbolic way of putting it in a permanent form and sharing it with other people. Technology. Technology is the advancements to make life better that help to increase trade and help countries stay powerful. This can take the form of shaping geography to help people better live in a space like a canal. This could be a military weapon to help scare people off from attacking you or to help you attack your neighbor to get more fertile space for your people. This could be computers that help you to share information and to run a better economy. Airplanes or transportation to help move things and people and ideas more places faster. Or it could be farming technology to help those few people who are farmers to grow more food to help feed more people. And finally, civilizations, as they grow, develop culture. This is their unique way of living. You have forms of art, music, dance, and fashion. You have their architecture, as they use their taxpayer dollars to build buildings. What becomes their unique expression of it as they go to eat? What are ways that they prepare the food that they have available to them? Art, music, and dance are inherent to all people who have ever existed and are very important elements as you add in architecture, fashion, and so on to understanding and rounding out a society. So these are the seven components for why and how a society rises and grows. Now let's look at what it takes to sustain a culture. So a culture starts, it's up, it's thriving. What does it need to do to keep thriving? 
Well, first, it needs to meet the basic needs of its members. Food, shelter, love, entertainment. These are just basic things to keep people doing their jobs, to keep all of the all of the cogs in the clock functioning because you remove any one of these elements and the whole order begins to fall apart. You need to keep your members motivated and engaged. When people become apathetic, when people become lazy, things fall apart. So you need them to want to keep civilization growing and advancing. You need to maintain a technological edge. You need to have the best weapons. You need to have the best way of sharing information and running your economy. You need to be able to reproduce and educate the next generation. The more people you have, the larger your civilization will grow, the better chance you have of birthing and raising someone to do something great for your civilization. You need to educate them in the what it means to be a part of that civilization, how to be successful in it, and how to push the civilization forward and to thrive. <coughs> you need to maintain internal and external order. You need to keep the people happy and in line. You need to keep your neighbors happy and in line. If these elements are extremely important to keeping your civilization going from an internal perspective and from your position within the region that you live. Finally, we have cultural collapse. We will break these down into two categories. The first are internal weaknesses. <clears throat> Things like drought, which means no or low amounts of water, and famine, which is no or low amounts of food. This starts to erode away at the core aspects of what the members of the society need. No water, no food, people begin to die or they begin to migrate, as in move to another area. Economic depressions. People lose jobs, people lose money. It begins to cramp what people are able to do, their ability to advance technology, their ability to take care of their basic day-to-day -day needs, and begins to weaken the structures of a civilization. Some other aspects, low birth rates. If you don't have enough people to grow up to farm the food and to run the government and all the aspects that keep a civilization going, that can put a major damper on what you're able to do. If the people become lazy or unruly um, and you have to spend more time and money keeping order or to motivate people to vote or to get educated. Disease is a huge factor. Uh, we have been very blessed with our medical system. However, you see throughout history, diseases come in and wipe out a third to half of the population. It is very, very devastating and can serve a major, if not fatal, blow to many civilizations. And you have the decline of education when people stop being willing to learn and just focus on their own enjoyment and just focus on themselves and not on benefiting the other people around them. These are all internal things that erode and collapse a civilization from the inside. You also have external weaknesses. Things like the loss of a trading partner. Say they get conquered. Say you make them mad and they no longer want to trade with you. This can have a major economic impact. Falling behind in military technology. If you don't keep up with your military stuff and your neighbor does, this makes you very vulnerable. In this situation here, the Chinese fell behind in their technology while the Europeans went on and created new naval technology. So you have in the background a steam-run steel ship 
going up against the wooden wind-powered Chinese ships. It will take very little imagination to figure out who won and what impact that made on the Chinese who had at that point fallen behind the times. At an eerily similar point, you have being conquered. If you do not keep up with the technology, you are subject to be conquered. As you see in the pictures here, on the left you have the Polish army in World War II that was using horses. You have the Nazi army on the right that was using tanks and planes. The one came in and conquered the other. Their civilization expanded and crushed the Polish civilization. Finally, you have natural disasters. Sometimes Mother Nature just plays her cards as such so that your civilization gets crushed. Here, it's a tsunami that is coming in and invading the shoreline. Sometimes it's a shift that happens in the globe that takes a place that was once thriving and flourishing and makes it a hot and scorching place. Something that's currently happening, the uh, one of the jet streams is subtly shifting that is now causing places that were once warm and inhabitable to start to become cold and not so inhabitable. So natural disasters can come in and play a key role from the outside. So in summary, you have the seven core components of how a civilization rises. You have the five key aspects of what it takes for a civilization to sustain itself. And finally, you have the two key core categories of internal weaknesses and external weaknesses that lead to civilizations collapsing.